So we now know what positions you might consider standing for, and it would be good to explore these roles in a little more depth. Marguerite, at the governing body level, what can a candidate, candidate expect if they were successful, and what kind of decisions are they responsible for? Thanks, Tamsin. So the mayor and the 20 councillors together form the governing body. And the governing body is responsible for making the big picture strategic decisions that affect the whole of Auckland. The very first thing that they do is they decide on the 30-year vision for Auckland, which we call the Auckland Plan, which, is rich, which really sets the long-term direction for our city. Um, and then they also decide on strategies, so like the waste minimization strategy is an example, or the economic development strategy. So these are the, the big strategies that really are going to guide um, the, the investments and the decisions that everybody does is to adopt bylaws. So some examples might when can you uh, walk your dog on the beach and what can you and cannot you do with your, uh, with your dog. A big um, part of the uh, governing body role is uh, to decide on budgets, so the 10-year budget, which we call the long-term plan, and also annual budgets. And it is the governing body um, that sets the rate for, for Auckland and, and what Aucklanders uh, will pay. They also monitor the performance of council and controlled organizations, what we call CCOs. So they make a whole lot of other decisions that affect the myriad of services that Auckland Council um, uh, delivers, and it can be bus timetables, it can be um, around libraries or um, public transport more generally. Big investment decisions that are made at the governing body level. So in terms of the, the commitment, the mayor's role is more than full-time, really. It is a significant both professional and um, personal commitment, certainly more than 40 hours a week and pretty much seven, um, seven days a week. And the mayor has an office that uh, supports them to, to operate. And that mayoral office, by law, has a dedicated budget, which is um, there for the, the mayor to be able to exercise their responsibilities. Um, the council of roles are also full time and uh, they're both daytime and evening commitments. The mayor and the councillors attend many of the, many meetings really, all the meetings of the governing body and its committees of the whole, other committees, workshops, panels, um, all kinds of, of meetings where um, you spend a lot of time in the, in the town hall. We will, the workshop, for instance, are organized to brief elected members on, on different um, subjects that they have to make decisions on. And elected members, or, or so councillors, um, like all elected members, attend uh, public events and um, deal with constituent queries and engage with the community. So it's a very much a public-facing role. And um, there is a myriad of other things that on an ad hoc basis they will be asked to do. So as the person in the room who has been a councillor, Michael, what does this look like uh, in reality? What, what can someone expect? Yes. Yeah, I, ha I have had the privilege of being um, a councillor. And I think to reiterate a couple of those points, um, it is re it's regional decision making. Um, it's not particularly local decision making and it, sort of, it is at the crux of that governance role. Um, it's really cool. You, you, you do have a day lined up full of uh, workshops, committees, subcommittees. Um, you, you get to sit alongside incredible staff and really work through those big policy, meaty issues. Um, so I definitely agree that it's more than full time. Um, and I often describe um, being a counsellor as it can be the most frustrating environment you're in. Um, but it is also the most rewarding and, and I think your ability to level up and be involved and put your thumbprint on the regional growth of, of the city is, um, is a really neat part of it and sort of that definitely outweighs all the rest of it. So um, as a regional decision maker, you're, you are based in the city a lot of the time. Um, you have offices here. Um, you're always sort of, you've got buckets of, of reading to do and you're always trying to think a couple of weeks ahead um, about the decisions you are about to make. 
So trying to get familiar with the issues around them and you know, 80% of the time they're not in your ward, so you're doing a lot of traveling around and just trying to best represent your ward or your community at that regional level. So, um, yeah, you definitely have events most nights and in the weekends, um, so yeah, it's certainly a bit of a lifestyle. Um, I would say there might be some other councillors that don't quite put in that work, but... Um, <laughs> we won't go there. Yeah, let's not go there, yeah. Um, so, thank you, Michael. So, Louise, in terms of uh, this, at, at the local uh, board level, is it similar? How does it differ? What can, what can people expect in terms of the responsibilities for um, delivering plans and priorities to their communities? Yeah, thanks, Tasman. So, that, look, the local board role is really about local civic civic leadership and local boards are responsible for decision making on local activities, issues and services. So this, this might be things like planning or upgrades to parks and town centres. It might be about local services at your recreation centre or at your pools or community programmes or it could be about local events, etc. Um, in terms of other roles that we have um, for local boards, uh, Marguerite talked about regional plans and bylaws, and local boards have an important role in providing local input into those plans and bylaws. So, again, things like freedom camping, dog bylaws, etc. One of the key responsibilities of local boards is every three years to engage with their communities and develop a local board plan. And this local board plan articulates the aspirations of their local communities and is a very important part of that local board role. Local board members also work with mana whenua and matawaka. They prioritise spending of the local budget and also um, monitor that spending and delivery of projects. And they're responsible for building strong relationships with local stakeholders and helping to support the building of strong communities. Awesome, thanks Louise. And Simon, given you were a local board chair, what does this look like? How, what, what, what does, uh, how, how was it in terms of your lived experience? I guess the um, first thing to say, um, Tamsin, is that um, there's no such thing as an average day as an elected member, and that's certainly true as a local board member. Um, every day is a bit different and the, um, Louise covered uh, the nuts and bolts in terms of, of what the role is and the sorts of decisions you'll be making, but a lot of that is driven by other people. And so I guess the key bit of advice I'd give anyone um, thinking about being an elected member, a local board member, is you're always going to have more things to get involved in than time. Um, and so being very clear about what you want to achieve out of your three years, um, what sorts of things are priorities and important for you and your community and um, and put the um, put your emphasis there. I guess also as, as part of that, um, staff are there to really support and advise and, and assist you and I guess it's making that point that it benefits your community to build that relationship. Some elected members don't quite see it that way. Um, it's your decision whether or not you take that advice but don't shoot the messenger. Yeah. And, and what is it like working alongside other elected members? The, this is quite an interesting thing because sometimes it's a bit of a, a surprise for people who get elected on a platform. But everyone gets elected wanting to achieve things and sometimes uh, you're on a board of seven people. Uh, everyone's been elected for different things and it takes a majority of people voting for that to achieve what you want to achieve. So. The, the best um, thing that you can do is, is build um, relationships with your colleagues, um, work together on what you have um, common ground on, um, play issues, not people, um, and then you'll get things achieved. It doesn't, um, you don't get anything out of your three years if you're constantly just one vote uh, in the wilderness. So working with colleagues is really important. And how do you, uh ensure that you're accurately representing the views of your community? I, I guess it's that thing that sometimes the, the loudest voices or the voices that are most readily available aren't always the most representative. And um, uh, it, is a, it is a thing that um, as an elected member there will be people that will contact you, that will be um, in touch and, um, and that's really useful to get a sense of, of issues and things that are out there. 
Um, but the best advice I'd give you is think about who you're not hearing from. Um, think about uh, which voices in the community you aren't accessing. Um, you make better decisions when you hear a range of views and it's always, um, uh, it's always in your interests to seek them out if they're not coming to you um, through the door. Awesome. Thanks, Simon and Michael. That's, that's great advice. Um, so for remuneration, uh, if successful, what does remuneration look like for elected members, Marguerite? And also I'd just like to acknowledge Genevieve, who's uh, put a question forward for Slido, which we will get to, um, but just to let you know that she's asked about uh, the remuneration for the mayor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So the remuneration for all elected members, and that's true for local bodies all around New Zealand, is set by the remuneration authority, which is an independent body. So the council doesn't have a say in um, the, the way the remuneration is, the, the levels the remuneration um, is set at. So for the mayor, the remuneration has been set for the new term at $296,000 per annum and the mayor can choose to have access to a um, council car if they so wish. For the councillors in the new term, there's going to be a new system which hasn't been uh, used before, whereby a minimum remuneration has been set for councillors at $106,306. Mm -hmm. And then there is a pool, a, a total pool of $430,000 which the governing body will choose to allocate to positions of extra responsibilities. And that includes the deputy mayor, it includes all councillors if they want to allocate more to each councillors and also uh, positions like the chairs of the committees of the hall and other positions of the responsibility that they might choose to allocate extra remunerations for. So that's going to be a, a new system. And it's a little bit different from local for local boards. So I'll get Louise to explain how that works. Yeah, thanks, Marguerite. So look, um, for local boards, the remuneration um, range is different for each board. And as Marguerite explained about the remuneration authority, they set a ranking for the local boards. And this takes into account different factors. This includes population, the total assets in the board, expenditure and social deprivation. So that's what the ranking is based on. We have a different rate for the chair. Um, the deputy chair receives 60% of the chair's remuneration and local boards receive 50% of uh, the chair's remuneration. So for the new term, um, the remuneration of the chairs will range between 85,000 to 99,000 and for members, um, the figure is between 44,000 to 49,000. Now look, I'll just also note for Waiheke and Aotea Great Barrier, the, um, the rates are lower because they have a smaller population. So that's basically the remuneration for the local boards. And Marguerite, do they receive additional reimbursement payments for the work that they're doing as an elected member? So the Remuneration Authority also set up um, the rate of some other expenses that can be reimbursed. The most obvious one is about transport costs, so whether it's um, public transport or, or the use of your car. And we've got an elected member expense policy that outlines all those, um, all those expenses and what, what elected members can claim. So mm -hmm. that's something that we can explain in more detail when people are elected and, and when they come into office. But there's one thing that um, I think is really important to emphasize, and that is that elected members are basically considered to be self-employed. So they are uh, responsible for their own taxes. So it's really important if you're elected that you get some financial and tax advice because you will have to cover your own taxes and you will also have to cover your ACC levies. So don't get caught. If you get elected, get advice and get ready. Okay, Marguerite, we also have a question here from Sarah via Slido. Kia ora, Sarah. Uh, why is remuneration so poor? This role requires strategic expertise and a huge time commitment. Mm. So, um, obviously the councils do not have a say in how the remuneration is set. This is decided by the remuneration authority. They have done a very thorough review of remuneration throughout the country 
um, over the last 18 months, and they have um, established the rates um, based on what they believe is fair remuneration, but also taking into account the fact that they consider that being an elected member is a commitment to your community. And they set the, um, the salary, of the, sorry, the remuneration of the mayor of Auckland as the biggest role in local government, and they use the role of an MP as a benchmark, and from there just decided the ranking of all the different, mm -hmm. uh, the different roles. But there is definitely a consideration that a service to your community comes into the role. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of uh, the support that people can expect to receive if they are elected, what does this look like for elected members? So first of all, for all elected members, both governing body and local board, we've got a program called Kurakawana, and that is the elected member development program. So it comprises um, a very uh, comprehensive induction program, so which really helps the elected member to come on board, and then ongoing professional development over the three years of the term. And um, the, the other thing that we do for elected members is we give them a phone and a computer if they so, if they so wish, and so there's also training and support on how to use that technology. So for the governing body, the mayor and the councillors have an office in the CBD, in the Auckland Council House um, on 135 Albert Street. And um, there are, so as I explained, the mayor as it's, uh, um, has their own office which uh, supports them. But the councillors are supported by a team of dedicated advisors, which we call the councillor support advisor team. And they do everything from dairy management and help with um, email, as well as constituent query, advice, research. So they were very, very closely as the right hand of their, of their councillor. And um, it's important to realize that the council staff as an organization exist to support the elected members make decisions. So we are here to provide advice and support so that they can exercise their, their governance role. And so the whole organization mm -hmm. is geared towards providing advice. And Louise, what does that look like for uh, local board members? Yes, yeah, so lo local board members um, have a local board office which will be based in their local community and they have a dedicated team that actually helps support them as well. So that team works really closely with them and helps them in fulfilling their role. Um, as Marguerite said, the organisation itself, the wider organisation of Auckland Council, also provides specialist advice and support to local board members. And we also have the local communications team also provides that support as well. So quite a range of people that are helping provide that advice to local board members and support. 